Hey everyone, welcome to the one in five, Adam Renshaw here, and I don't have any co-hosts with me today, Abel is behind the board, and Rebecca was not able to join us this week, but I do have Christy Gattrell, CEO of Bighorn Hospital Association, and we're going to just have a chat, does that sound good to you, Christy? Yes, thanks for having me, Adam. Awesome, no problem, so um, Christy... We were kind of just talking about how long you've been with the Bighorn Hospital Association. Can you just start by telling us what is the BHHA, Bighorn Hospital Association, and how did you get started working there? I've been with this hospital for 28 years. Um, I do feel like it's it's definitely a part of my heart. Um my mother worked there for 30 years oh my goodness. <laughs> in the business office. When I began at the hospital, um, they were in need of an x-ray tech. And I had applied for x-ray school. However, um, the Billings, St. Vincent's School of Radiography and Billings only accepted seven students a year. So it was very difficult to get in. Wow. So I wasn't accepted the first year. So in the meantime, Kathy Salveson took me under her wing, and I got, I received my, uh, uh, I received a permit to be able to do x-rays. And at that time, the hospital only had um, the regular x-ray machine. We did some fluoro, um, and she did mammography. Those were the only um, tests available at that time. Once I was accepted into school, the hospital was fantastic in supporting me. Awesome. They, uh, they paid for a student loan for me. I went to school for two years. I took call every other weekend until I finished. Um, and once that happened, I worked under another lady for about a year, and then she left. So being the only one left, it, it was offered to me if I wanted to become the manager of me, myself, and I. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so um, at that time, I was able to... Uh, I hired my sister-in-law at that time, Jennifer Hammond. We put her through the Weber State Program, and I was her mentor and trained her. And the two of us started building the radiology department. Um, currently, I believe there's about seven employees there in, in radiology. Wow. We added uh, CAT scan services uh, a number of years ago, probably 15 years ago, uh, which has always continually been updated. We have MRI. Right, that's ultrasound. a big deal. It is a big deal. It's a big deal not to have to travel to another, to Billings, and wait for maybe a week or two to get in. We can yeah. pretty much accommodate folks and, and get them in most of the time same day or as soon as their insurance uh, will approve their claim. Can I tell you a quick story? Yes. So I recently, end of last year, had uh, was I was having knee problems, and I went to see Dr. Upchurch. Um, at Bighorn Valley, and he said, he did an ultrasound and said, you need to, we should probably get an MRI just to, just to be sure. Um, it was December 30th, and I was at the end of my insurance year, right? And he was like, let me see if they, when they can get you in. They called me that day, got me in that day, which was huge for me. For your insurance. For my insurance to be able to get in one day before my year plan was all over, and I had already met all of that stuff. So that was a real awesome thing for me to be able to not have to drive to Billings, not have to wait a week, or it would have been more than that. Yeah. I mean, usually when I've had to get an MRI, it's been like a month yeah. out before they can schedule me. So that was really cool. So I just wanted to interject that right there. Um, we're going to be talking about how important having a, a hospital in our small community, a, in our large county, which covers 
5,000 square miles and has over 13,000 residents, how important it is to have a hospital in our community. So that is an illustration of why uh, it's so important to be able to have these services, not to mention emergency services, which we'll probably get to later. But go ahead and finish. So you were in radiology, and then something happened because now you're the CEO of the hospital. How did that come about? Well, unfortunately, the, the CEO that uh, was there uh, became ill. Oh. And one day I happened to be there on a Saturday working a, a women's health day event and he pulled me into his office and I thought, oh, hope I'm not in trouble. <laughs> and he said, I, I need to uh, be gone for a little while and get some treatments. And I was wondering if you could maybe step in for me and just fill in while I'm gone. Um, I was shocked because I thought, what, what do I know about certainly being a CEO of the hospital? Um, he encouraged me, <laughs> telling me that he thought I had a good relationship with, you know, I, the doctors there. I, I knew the staff, and certainly I knew the hospital from being there so many years. So I, I, I wanted to do whatever I could to help. Hmm. And so I said, okay. And unfortunately, he passed away within six months. Oh, my goodness. So at that time, I think everybody was just kind of shell-shocked from how, how did this happen so quickly. Uh, the board of directors at that time asked if maybe I'd be interested in in um, trying it out for a year just to see if I liked it, if, if I could do the job. Um, and I thought to myself, I'll, I'll, I'd never get an opportunity like this again. <laughs> and I knew if I didn't try, I'd always wonder if I could have done it. Sure. So for me, it was, I mean, it's, this has been a huge... Huge win for me. Awesome. And you enjoy it. I do enjoy it. It d doesn't mean it doesn't come without a lot of stress. But, Absolutely. But I love I love my community, and I've always loved that hospital. And I, I see what amazing people do every day, and I've seen how it's changed people's lives, um, saved lives. And I think, yes, if we didn't have this critical access hospital – and someone's having a heart attack, and you're going to tell them, well, you're going to have to drive another 40 miles? That's maybe not the option you'd want to hear. Yeah, that, that sort of begs a question, like, what would this area look like without this critical access hospital? And we're so fortunate because we have a fantastic EMS team, one of the best in the state. And so Hardin has a lot to be proud of with mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And with that becomes, I think, comes a responsibility that the community does need to support its local businesses, whether it's the, the local clinic or the, the dental office you know, and the hospital, because without it, if we don't support it and we would lose it, mm -hmm. what, what would that look like? Yeah. And it would be huge. It, yeah, it would. C can you explain what a critical access hospital is? You guys, uh, the Bighorn Hospital Association is a critical access hospital. What does that all entail? So critical access means that we're, we're able to bill differently than mm. a, a private profit hospital. And so we do get a subsidy at the end of the year for all of the costs that we incurred for taking care of patients. So it helps us be fiscal, fiscally well more sound yes okay. um, not that we don't still have a lot of struggles because it's we've been fighting for years for um, a solid nursing team sure. there's such a shortage across the entire united states and to ask someone to come live in hardin montana if they don't have ties to here it's it can be a tough situation to bring people in what are some of the unique challenges you face um with running a critical access hospital in Bighorn County? You mentioned staffing just now. What are some of the others? I guess part of, um, so you have a small team, but everybody has to wear numerous hats. Okay. Because in order to offer a multitude of services, everybody has to be, be trained in several different aspects. Like even, well, I always go back to radiology, but you're not just the MRI tech. You're also the CT tech. You also do the mm. mammography, and you might run the department. Oh, my gosh. Um, 
the laboratory. I mean, we have a fantastic lab. Yes, Will Peterman, yes. right? Yes. yes, Will does an, an amazing job, and we offer we offer most lab tests that you could have anywhere. Awesome. We send very little out of it out, and so it, you're able to get results right away. Yep. He, he's really excited right now because he's working on getting the testing for doing antibody testing for this COVID virus. Nice. So uh, with that came, he needed, he needed people that had been proven positive. So I was really happy to volunteer to donate my blood. And within an hour, I knew that I, I had did, antibodies. That I have antibodies. Okay. So that, that really brings us to something I wanted to chat with you about. And that is that you've had COVID-19. So what was that experience like for you? Uh, was it painful? Was it something that was very difficult to go through? Did you have minor symptoms like we've heard about? Or what was that like? I, I thought maybe I had the flu. Okay. However, because it had just started here, I was number three in Bighorn County. Um, it, it, didn't, it seemed very surreal. I, I just couldn't believe it. I had been really trying hard to make sure I was always wearing a mask. I'd been using the hand sanitizer, washing my hands, staying home. I, 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 of course, had been to the grocery store um, and been to a couple of meetings, but other than that was really just going home and coming to work. My husband, who's a rancher, um, I was really worried for him because he tends to get very ill when he gets a respiratory issue. Mm. And uh, he had 50 heifers standing out there in the arena to be calved. And I knew that was something I couldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I actually had moved into town. My parents uh, were away in Arizona, so the house was empty, and they had a cat that was pretty lonely. So oh. I said, I'll go take care of the cat, protect my husband. Had only been there for about a week when I came down with this virus. Oh, no. So part of um, the precautions that we've taken at the hospital is that every day when you come to work, of course, you had your temperature checked, and you reported if you were having any symptoms. And... I did have a headache. I had body aches. It never ran a temperature during the day, but at night I, I would run a fever of around 100. Okay. Just didn't feel good. So at first they thought, no, it's, it's probably just the flu. Well, then they said, well, we should probably test you. <laughs> so they tested me for the flu and for COVID-19, and I, I, I literally just about fell over when they said you're positive. Wow. And then after that was a really long journey because I, I probably felt fine within a few days after that. I had a little bit of a cough. Um, and so that was the only respiratory stuff that you yes, had was a cough? Yes. Okay. Um, but I could not. I, I, every week I was going in and getting tested. They tested me seven times before I got a negative result back. Oh, wow. And that's not really a fun test. It, it, you had to do deep nasal? Yes, yes. <laughs> I said I felt like I'd had a lobotomy oh, like seven times. <laughs> seven times, yeah, not just once or twice. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So so you only really felt ill for a couple of days, but you were still testing positive up to what? What did you say? Seven days afterwards? Not 31 days. 31 days. Oh, 31 wow. Days. So how long ago was this then? I was able to come back to work here just a couple of weeks ago. Okay. So I missed 31. I, I was out of work for a month. Oh, wow. So I, I worked for my mom's computer at home. But, you know, you couldn't see anyone. And you couldn't see your husband. No. Oh. He would bring groceries and leave them in the <laughs> backyard for me. Oh, bless him. <laughs> 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 That's so nice. So, I mean, that was, you know, people in this community, I mean, it was overwhelming, the, the support I had. I oh, mean, people were good. calling. I had flowers. I had, you know, it was, I, I truly didn't know how many people cared until this had happened. I mean, one lady, at Laurel Slattery would bring me lunch every day and leave it oh, on the step. That's cool. Yeah. That's really great. Pretty phenomenal, the people that live here. So, we've talked a little bit about how COVID has affected you. How has COVID affected the day-to-day -day of the hospital and how so the hospital runs? We certainly are operating differently. We have, when we have no visitors, you know, I think about our nursing home and 
I just recently lost my aunt a week ago, and I hadn't been able to see her for three weeks prior to that. One, because I had the virus, and two, because we have no visitors, and they are such a vulnerable mm -hmm. population that we, we have done everything we can to try and keep them safe. Uh, the workers there have been unbelievable. I mean, they've been so diligent about going to work and going home and trying to protect what they feel is th their own family, in a sense. Sure. Um, at the hospital, we, when someone comes and wishes to be seen, they're asked if they're having any of the symptoms for COVID, and if so, they're taken to a special area that's for respiratory illness so that we can keep them separate from someone coming in, perhaps for an MRI or a regular lab test so that we can try and protect everyone, mm -hmm. but everyone's required to wear a mask. So everyone at work has masks. We've separated even how we function at the hospital. And I've always felt like the hospital's really unique in that everybody, everybody does care for each other as a family. And I can tell you there's people in the business office that I haven't seen them in a month. Oh, I know. And we, we keep them separate just so that they're not mixing in with anyone that's taking care of a patient. Yeah, we, we have similar struggles, too, with uh, how we've been working at Bighorn Valley Health. You Center, feel the so. separation. Yeah, yeah. Um, going back to the nursing home real quick, it's got to be difficult for s some of the elderly who are, who are in there and aren't able to receive visitors. Do you know of any unique ways that people can support the elderly at this point? So we've tried to um, make it so that they could see each other. We have a courtyard out back, and mm -hmm. so there's a bench out there. People can come to, th to the back alley there and sit on one side of the fence so that we can keep that social distance. Sure. But at least they can see each other. But it's very confusing for someone who, you know, has dementia, and, and yeah. why all of a sudden am I not seeing my family? Oh, or, man. It's, it's very difficult. And, of course... Then CMS gets involved, and they're requiring you to, they don't want them to even have communal dining. Oh, God. So, so now they have to eat in their room. Y yeah, you feel like you're making, you feel like you've made a prison for them instead of a, yep. a, a place to live. Yeah. We, Abel and I actually uh, played there last Christmas for uh, Joe reached out and we pl went and played music, played some Christmas tunes for him. And they just really loved. Oh, they absolutely uh, do. That, that moment, that interaction and everyone was eating and there was a big meal and there was music playing. So I see how important yes. uh, that is in a situation like that. Their mental well being is absolutely agreed. Um, let's shift for just a second. Um, let's let's go back to the hospital. You guys have been undergoing a capital campaign and been doing a number of renovations. Can you give us an update on the renovations? What some of that's looking like? Where's the progress happening? Is it close to being done? It is getting very close to being done. It's this has been really this has been a difficult project, but it's been a very exciting pr project. So it was eleven million dollars. Ooh. So it's the largest project that this hospital's ever undertaken. This hospital was started in 1959. Okay. So 60 years of building. <laughs> so, so I've been part of two of the big renovations. I was there for sharing the vision, okay. which um, I think, I, I can't remember how much that project was. But certainly this $11 million project is the largest. We built a brand new emergency department. Okay. So it has six rooms. Two of those are trauma rooms that are set up um, with breakaway sliding glass doors. We have an a, a ambulance garage that the ambulance can pull right directly into. Patients come right into those rooms. We also have a decontamination room. So if we've had someone that possibly has a chemical spill, Kay. we're able to get those chemicals off of them. The water is stored in a separate tank, so it's not put into our city city water system. Um, those two trauma bays are set up with a system called Avera, which is a telemedicine feature. There's a monitor on the wall. You press a button on the wall, and immediately you're connected with a board-certified emergency physician. 
that can offer assistance, give orders to the nurse so that it's all hands on deck when, when we need to be. Great. Um, sometimes it's m- maybe sometimes we need nursing documentation. They can provide that service for us as well. So I think it's given a, a, a sense of comfort maybe to our nurse practitioners. If they have a question, they've got a doctor, they can, they can ask right away. Um, knowing that our other doctors are on call, mm-hmm. it may take them a few minutes to get there. And so this is something, this is another backup system. Awesome. And the main entrance has been moved from west to east. So our main entry is not quite open yet. Okay. And so we will end up with just one entry. Um, one of our issues before was the hospital, you could come in several doors. We wouldn't always know who was in the building or why sure. they were there. Sure. And um, so this gives us more security as well as, as, as we've all seen, our, our world's not, our world has changed, and we need to think about our safety and our patient's safety. And so that, that gives, that's going to be a really nice way for us to secure our building. Great. And is this just phase one? Is there? So we are in phase two now. So okay. the, the emergency department was completed. Um, we had kind of a soft grand opening for that in which the community was able to come and see that. I don't know what our future is going to look like for a grand opening to see all of it since we're all locked down in our COVID. But uh, within the next couple of weeks, we think that the the building should be complete. Awesome. They're working on landscaping, and and we're waiting for some cement to cure in a driveway so that we can open up another parking lot. So that everyone's had to put up with a lot in the last couple of years. No doubt, no doubt. Uh, And the neighbors have been understanding, and the staff has been accommodating and the community's been great. Awesome. So we've had we've had a lot of support, but um, you know, Bill Hodges is our foundation director, and he's gone out and certainly tried to uh, get people involved and, and get these donations in. But he's also our public health officer, and so he has been very busy with the COVID and setting up incident command and and doing all the functions of of a safety officer. So. Great. Well, you know, we're right about at time, but if someone wanted to donate to that capital campaign, how would they go about doing that, Christy? They can certainly call us at the hospital, Okay. and we would put them in touch with Bill Hodges, and he can get them a packet of information on because um, it's a great way to have a tax deduction sure. and to support your local community so that we're always there for you in the future. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming in. This is the one in five podcast, uh, video cast, whatever you want to call it. We are um, so glad to have you in finally, Christy. I know we've been talking about this for about a month. So thanks for coming in and sharing. If you have any questions, you can reach us at the one in five podcast at iCloud.com. Thanks for joining. <laughs>